the mini mill comes from the factory with a Jacob's style chuck and I call it a Jacob's style chuck because it is a replica or a copy of the Jacob's chucks that were invented in 1902. Because the US still widely uses the inch unit system uh, just about any shop in America will have at least one set of these drills which are from 1 16th of an inch up to a half an inch in increments of a 64th of an inch. If you're new to the world of machining you may not be familiar with so-called number drills. This is a standard set of number drills going from number one which is the largest down to a number 60 which is the smallest and as you can see the number 60 is a very small drill bit. The benefit of the number drills is that they fill in a lot of the gaps that are in between sizes on the fractional drills that we looked at a minute ago. So they give you a lot more flexibility and they are also required if you're doing tapping where you need to drill a hole that is the right size uh, for a tap. Outside of the US, inch size drill bits are relatively uncommon and of course everybody else in the world besides the US pretty much uh, is standardized on metric. That's becoming more and more common in the US and even for hobby shops and amateur shops like mine uh, you're likely to have a set of metric drills or several sets of metric drills. If you'd like to learn more about drilling on the mini mill I have a separate video about that that I did several years ago that goes into more detail. When compared with drilling on a standard drill press the table gives you very precise control over the positioning of holes and particularly on this mill which has the built-in digital readouts you can accurately space holes easily to within a thousandth of an inch or so or a hundredth of a millimeter you know 40 years ago you would be very hard pressed to find any machine in a home shop that could work with that kind of precision at prices that are comparable with the mini mill today Well, as much as I like it uh, for drilling purposes, of course, the real benefit of the mini mill is its ability to cut metal side to side, which you generally can't do and shouldn't try to do on a drill press. So that opens up a whole new world of possibilities and shapes and things that you can make. To set up for milling, we first have to remove the drill chuck, and then we can use either a collet or an end mill holder to hold the end mill. If you're familiar with the mini mill, you know that you have to find a way to lock the spindle so that you can turn the drawbar and uh, release it from the back end of the drill chuck arbor. On most mini mills, there's a small hole in the side of the spindle into which you insert this holding device. You hold that with one hand and then up above here, you use a wrench to loosen the drawbar. So let's look up there. Now here again, this model 6450 mil is different from any of the ones I've reviewed before. On all of the others, and the top of the drawbar actually extended above the top of the head so that it was directly accessible. On this mill, it's recessed down in here, so you have to have some other way to hold on to it. For that purpose, the manufacturer has included this long T-handle wrench and it drops down and then you can turn it until it drops onto the head of the drawbar. And then once you can feel that you're turning the drawbar, you can lock the drawbar in place. So this is another feature that's new to me. You just rotate it around 90 degrees and it locks in position. There's a magnet inside here so that when you turn the knob clockwise a quarter turn, a sensor up here deactivates the motor. So that locking mechanism takes the place of this handheld pin, which is a, a nice benefit because you now have your other hand free to hold on to whatever you're working on down here. Now you first have to turn the T-handle up above. And as you can see, the chuck is rotating. And you may have been able to hear that click, but there's a certain point at which a spring-loaded pin up in here snaps into place to lock the spindle and now turning the t-handle i can loosen the drawbar that goes down into the arbor for the chuck and of course the arbor has an internal thread that mates with the drawbar thread you also have to have a way to break free the holding power between the taper on the chuck arbor 
and the taper and the spindle because the tapers themselves actually uh, lock up pretty tightly. So the typical way to do that is to tap the top of the drawbar with a brass hammer and just a small tap with a hammer is generally enough to break free the force of the taper and allow the chuck to drop down so that you can remove it completely. Now the process of tapping with the hammer is a little more complicated on this mill than on others I've used because the uh, top of the T-handle wrench is way up here which on my normal workbench is <laughs> pretty much at the limit of my reach. So I've got it lower down right now on the hydraulic table uh, and it's still a bit of a reach for me. But in any case I'll just tap that lightly and that should be enough to break the taper free and let's see if we can now turn the T-handle and loosen the chuck. Now I can use my free hand to hold on to the chuck while I turn the T-handle up top until we get to a point where the chuck drops down. There's a variety of tooling available for the mini mill that uses the R8 taper and this is an example of a collet and collet is one type of tool holder and probably the most commonly used on the mini mills and the way that a collet works is your end mill has a shank which fits the collet and as the collet is drawn up into the spindle the taper forces the three sides of the collet to clamp down very tightly but evenly on the shank of the end mill so that holds it tightly in place and also ensures that it's centered uh, exactly with the rotational center of the spindle. An alternative way to hold end mills is to use an end mill holder or also called an end mill adapter and it uh, works a little differently than the collet but has the same net effect. In the end mill holder the end mill goes into a rigid hole and is clamped into place with a set screw. So later on in this series we'll look in more detail about the pros and cons of these two types of holders and why you might choose one versus the other. There's a variety of other types of tooling that also fits into the R8 spindle. And this is an example of a boring head which is used to bore holes that are typically larger than you can drill with the drill bit. And this is an example of a face mill which is used to make a wide cut, in this case two inches wide, on the flat surface of a workpiece. Later on I'll demonstrate some drilling and milling operations on the mini mill, but for right now I wanted to talk some more about the T-handle wrench and the location of the digital readout tablet display. There are a few concerns I have about this location of the DRO display tablet, at least as it relates to how I work and the layout of my shop. But as you can see here there's a lot of glare on the screen and that's actually reflected from overhead LED lamps that are built into the ceiling of my shop. And also, as I mentioned, because I'm only five foot six tall, the DRO tablet is actually up above my line of sight, so I have to tilt my head back to look at it at all. And then with this potential glare problem, I think reading it is going to be a problem for me in its current location. In addition to that, I'm concerned that as I reach up with this T-handle wrench that there's a possibility that sooner or later I may accidentally whack the face of the DRO with this wrench and cause the display to be cracked. So I started thinking about uh, what I might do to relieve some of those concerns. So one possibility is just to use a standard ratchet wrench with a 17 millimeter socket. And if I use this extra long socket, I can get by without an extension so the wrench is pretty well clear of the DRO display. But a problem with that is that the ratchet wrench is not the ideal tool for loosening the drawbar because you have to go back and forth multiple times. So I'm not real enthusiastic about that solution. If you're a regular viewer of my YouTube channel, you may have seen my video on this device that I made specifically to uh, handle the drawbar on my larger SX4 mill. I also have a problem with that mill because it's bigger and taller than this one and I have the same problem with needing to reach up above to loosen the drawbar. It's a 
pretty big and heavy, about 800 pound uh, bench mill. I use it whenever my mini mill is too small for the job. So I made this special tool and it has a hex head here that engages with the socket in the top of the drawbar and it has these brass weights that give it some mass so it can spin around. Once I give a little turn, it will unscrew the drawbar all the way. And then I also add this little hammer attachment here. Once I've loosened the drawbar by a turn or two, I can use this built-in hammer attachment to pop loose the taper. So that got me thinking, and I thought, well, maybe I can make something similar for the mini mill. And so I made a mini version. This one's really just a proof of concept. I wanted to make sure that it would work before I spent a lot of time uh, refining it <laughs> into something fancy that didn't work. It's kind of complicated to cut a hex on the end of the thing, so I decided instead to just put a square on the end and then use this 17 millimeter socket to engage with the top of the drawbar. I also didn't add a hammer attachment, but that's part of the design. So if it works out, I can, uh, I can do that at some point if I need to. Otherwise, I can just tap with a hammer on the top of this. But even before I made it, I realized that the DRO could not stay up here. And in any case, I had already come up with a plan to move the DRO uh, for the reasons I described earlier. So let's get the DRO out of the way. So this just slides out here. Now I have to remove this plate. The plate is held in place by two Phillips head screws. A long extension on my power screwdriver was the easiest way to get that off. Naturally the screw has fallen to the floor. Now we'll get the other side. After some experimentation I decided to relocate the, the DRO display tablet down here near the bottom of the column. So I drilled and tapped two 4mm holes. The DRO manning plate from up above will now be moved down to here and that will be held in place by two button head screws. On the back side I've drilled some access holes. Since there's no easy way to get washers and nuts back in here, especially on this hole, I decided to use these little nylock style nuts. I can hold them in a nut driver and then I drilled these access holes just big enough to allow the nut driver through. Okay, so I've got it mounted on there. And this arm, of course, can swing back and forth. If that arm looks at all familiar to you, you may have seen my DRO mount on my PM1228 lathe. And I have a similar arm to mount a swing arm lamp on my Grizzly bandsaw. If it passes the first set of tests, then I'll probably put another flexible joint up here so that I can change the angle of tilt of the tablet display. And to give it a more finished appearance, I happen to have some of these one inch end caps around from a previous project. So now with the tablet relocated, let's go back and try our little speeder handle and see how that works. So first I'll drop the 17 millimeter socket down there. It slips over the top of the drawbar. Let's go ahead and use this spinner to mount a one half inch end mill. So I'm first going to put the spindle in the locked position and now I'll insert the R8 collet. I have to keep this side with the slot here pointed to the right. The little spinner lifts up along with the drawbar as I push up so I'll just turn it a few turns to engage it with the collet. And now I'll take the end mill the end mill orientation doesn't matter. It does if you're using an end mill holder, but not a collet. I'll push the collet up, and now we'll give this a spin to lock it up, tighten it down, and we're done. Now let's go ahead and remove the end mill. I've got the spindle in the locked position, so I'll go ahead and insert the spinner. Before I loosen the collet, I want to have my hand here underneath the end mill in case it drops out. Sometimes they'll drop out right away. Other times you have to tap up here with a hammer to get it loose, but you never know. Oh, so this one came right out. So now we'll spin this to remove the collet. And there we go. So for my way of working, I think that's a much better solution than the long T-handle wrench. 
As far as the 17 millimeter socket down in here, I think that can safely stay in there, uh, but I'm going to remove it anyway. And my long-term plan is if this proves out, I'll make a new center post for this. Instead of using this square peg on the end here, I'll cut a 17 millimeter hex into it instead. One thing I really enjoy about machining as a hobby is that if I find something on one of my machines that doesn't fit my working style, I can almost always make a modification to get it the way I want it.